Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome my guest, Brett Kugelmass. He is the host of the Titans of Nuclear Podcast. He's Managing Director of Energy Impact Center and the CEO of Last Energy. Brett, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I was uh, really excited when you came on my podcast. So it's uh, great to exchange the favor here. Yeah, happy to have you. Um, so, Brett, I didn't warn you, um, but if you've seen or watched my podcast or listened, you know that guests introduce themselves. So now I've given <laughs> you three different titles here. I don't, I don't, I, well, yeah. So uh, if you don't mind, imagine you've arrived somewhere, you don't know anyone, you have less than 60 seconds to introduce yourself. Please go ahead. Um, well, my background formally is as a mechanical engineer. I got a master's from Stanford in robotics and uh, leveraged that into a career of entrepreneurship. Uh, where my company was one of the first in the autonomous vehicle spaces, uh, specifically drones. And then after pivoting uh, my life journey, uh, we sold that company and pivoted my life journey towards energy and climate issues, uh, founded the Energy Impact Center, which over the years has led to the exploration of nuclear energy through the Titans of Nuclear podcast. And then as of these last couple of years, our private development efforts through Last Energy. And, and where are you based? You said you graduated from Stanford. What part of the country do you live in? Yeah, I was out in the Bay Area for about 10 years. Um, and then about five years ago, I moved to Washington, D.C. Um, but previous to COVID, I was on the road, international travel every other week. And now that's starting to pick back up again. So I'm a bit all over the place. I spent right. a lot of time in Europe um, as well as D.C. Well, so then let's talk about, if you mentioned Europe there. I mean, there's a ton to talk about. And and in my view, especially after February 24th, right, the invasion of, of Ukraine, that this is should be seen and is likely will be seen as an inflection point in, in energy security, the future of no, nuclear hydrocarbons, et cetera. There's a mad dash for hydrocarbons of all kinds, of course, now, as you well know. But t tell me what's happening in, in Europe, because I know the, the Belgians have announced that they're extending the lives of, of their, their nuclear plants. The Germans inexplicably are still going to close their remaining reactors. But w what do you see now in, in particular after the invasion of Ukraine? What is the what's the future of Rosatom? I mean, there are a lot of issues we could discuss here, but give me the broad overview, if you don't mind. OK, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a European expert, uh, but I do have some experience, you know, both through my company and just through meeting other experts out there. But I like I cannot, you know, even begin to pretend to say I've got a comprehensive understanding sure. of what's happening or what's going to happen. But listen, I mean, for a long time, you know, for many years, we've been traveling out to Europe, Eastern Europe, and and this topic of energy security has always been on their minds. It, like this isn't a new thing. Right, it's just right. come to a head uh, with when you know, with the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and the the new instability that this is presenting to energy access and energy resources, you know, uh, directly to Europe, but indirectly, it's going to have ripple effects throughout the world. Right, um, right. So I think, you know, I think we fundamentally entered a new era. There was obviously a lot of things like bumbling, you know, bubbling under the surface. But I think now it's just become easier and more relevant for everyone to talk about energy security as you know, one of their top energy concerns. Whereas be historically, it was mostly about climate um, was the number one energy related concern. I think energy security is is probably now the number one. Um, well, that's that's interesting because I I, I think I, I agree with you in that that energy security now has surpassed. I, I would say trumped, but I'm not going to has surpassed the issue of climate that climate has necessarily been pushed to the back because simply because and partly because of cost right where europeans are now paying what seven times for you know the amount of for natural gas as we are here in the u.s but also just that i think it's about diversity of supply as well and and, and is that it that the that that the, the broader understanding of the need for a variety of, of electric generation sources besides nat gas and and coal and renewables I think diversity of supply is an energy strategy that you see around the world. Um, and you'll see countries write it into their constitution, into their energy, you know, their five, 10, 20 year en energy planning documents. Diversity of supply is key. I personally don't think diversity of supply um, should be the, necessarily should be the end goal. I think it should be security of supply. And it just so happens that that overlaps pretty heavily, you know, oftentimes. But that is typically because 
supply of energy often needs to be tra transported um, in the form right. of fuel and uh, and relies on you know a global supply chain. I, I think nuclear energy actually bucks that trend a little bit. I think nuclear energy is is the one of the one energy sources that you can have security of supply without having diversity of supply, just because you can store so much energy in your country on site. It requires just so little material. Most of the materials that are necessary to build a nuclear plant can be found um, indigenously. Um, you know, maybe not the fuel, but certainly you could stock up on, you know, 100 years worth of fuel, you know, in any given country with not much additional cost. So uh, I, if, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I, I like that idea about the energy security. And that's something that I've talked about a lot and people, particularly after the, the blackouts here in Texas, that that energy security means on site fuel. Yeah, right? yeah. That that is the key. And as you remember, you know, during the Trump administration, Secretary Perry pushed that at the Department of Energy. I, I remember and he, that. I remember that. Yeah. And he, I actually and didn't he, think it was and, so dumb. People thought it was like a, a coal thing, a thing for the coal industry. I actually didn't think it was that dumb. Yeah. Well, now, I mean, it's looking, you know, like he was right, you know, it very clearly he was right because those plants that had on-site fuel during the, the blackouts were the ones that did the best. So, yeah. but, but keep going on that part about having that on-site. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what you're saying, but you're talking about that on-site fuel, meaning, meaning energy security and that ability to stockpile relatively small amounts of material, fissile material that then you can put into your reactors and that that gives you supply, that gives you security. Is that, am I reading that back correctly? I mean, I was thinking about it like, yeah, like on a country basis, not necessarily on a site basis, but I mean, as you've articulated so many times so eloquently about how the grid works, you, you have this like instantaneous transfer of, you know, of, of the generation of energy and, and, um, and the distribution of energy or, or the reception of it from whoever consumes that energy. Um, I guess what I'm saying is there's also this, you know, with fuel, and once again, this is nothing new. You, you for one, have, have articulated this so well. Uh, fuel is part of this like instantaneous system. Now, now, with certain types of fuel, it doesn't have to be so instantaneous. You can pile a bunch of coal up in a coal yard. Gas, it's a little more instantaneous, right? When it comes to delivering um, parts for you know renewables, yeah, sure. Once you have the renewable up and running, um, you know it can continue to produce energy. You know there, though it has obviously all of its other um, intermittency and other issues associated with it. But uh, but you know they, they rely on a global supply chain. You rely on the continuous flow of of parts around the planet. Right. Nuclear can disaggregate from that a little bit. Like nuclear, you can, a country can say, okay, we're going to build you know just a few buildings that represent the you know the total capacity our ever our country will ever need kind of like france built right. just a few buildings for like a g7 country um to give it all of its power uh and then you know what else do you need to do to secure that supply for your country well you just have to buy a moderate amount of uranium or enriched uranium or whatever it is but like it is certainly reasonable and definitely feasible uh for a country to totally secure its energy independence for all time by building just a few buildings and front loading on a little bit of fuel. That, but that's nuclear. That's what nuclear can do. Sure. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because an area I really don't know much about is that fuel supply chain. And I know during the, when I think Hillary was running for president, there was a lot of talk about Russian uranium and so on. And now it's clear Russia is a big supplier, but so are the Australians, right? And, uh, Oh, what is it? Niger is a big uh, a uranium supplier. So walk me through if you could. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you know these issues better than I do about that fuel. So the, the uranium fuel supply chain now globally after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, is that going to accrue to the benefits of the Australians? Who 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 wins here? OK, once again, this is an area that I'm not like a deep expert in, but I'll okay. just offer some, some thoughts. Sure, and sure. So there's uranium everywhere. Like there's uranium in the U.S. that we don't mine. Um, it's a commodity, so whether or not you open up the mine or expand the mine or even look for more, and by the way, uranium is everywhere. If I haven't said it again, uranium is everywhere. Um, whether or not you look for it all just depends on the economics. So it's not like other types of minerals or even other certain technologies that you are like very reliant on a specific country or geography to get it from. It really is just a matter of like market forces driving, you know, the opening up of mines. Okay, that's like part one of the fuel supply is the uranium. There's plenty of uranium. Uh, friendly countries have more than enough of it. Canada, Australia, I mean, the U.S. has plenty of it. It's just a matter of, um, 
it's just a matter of you know mining it and producing the OR and getting it right. through that sure. process. The next stage, now you've narrowed your supply chain in terms of you know enrichment. Um, you know, fortunately in the U.S., uh, you know, we are kind of like one of the world guarantors of nuclear security. So like, it's cool if we build a bunch of enrichment facilities um, and some of our allies also. Um, so we'll be okay. And I think our allies will be okay when it comes to enrichment, though even people who aren't necessarily our allies also have enrichment capabilities. So they'll probably be okay too. Um, and then you've got the production of fuel bundles. And, you know, here, uh, yeah, once again, narrowed supply chain, I think maybe there's like eight different companies out there that make this. But once again, you know, even though Russia is one of them, you know, we do that here. We've got a few factories here in the U.S. that do that really well. So we're at no risk of, of having an inability to produce fuel bundles once we uh, have that enriched um, uranium supply. Um, and yeah, so there's really no problem with the uranium fuel supply chain. Uh, yeah, prices may go up here and there, but just it doesn't drastically affect the price of electricity either because the the fuel is such a small component of the final deliver cost of electricity, like 5%, like something negligible. So sure, even if sure. it doubles, you're talking about only increasing, you know, which, which is, would be drastic. Uh, you're only talking about increasing your final output of electricity, maybe by like 5%. Sure. Whereas the price of gas for generation, I mean, we're seeing this now after the closure of Indian Point, the criminal closure of Indian Point in New York. Um, inexcusable, the execrable closure of Indian <laughs> no, Point. No, keep going, keep going. <laughs> the maddening, the insane, the... Uh, yeah, all the nuclear closures, you could apply that, um, could apply. Yeah. That. But now you're seeing massive increases in, in electricity prices in New York, partly because of the the huge increase in, in, in natural gas prices. So I, I think that's an other part of the energy security equation, though, isn't it, right? That that you don't have these big, big price spikes that are going to hurt the poor and the middle class. And, and that's another aspect of that. Don't you, shouldn't that be included as well? This is why we have rules and regulations and and this is why the government gets involved in these types of things. Like I'm more of like a like government leave your hands off of it type of guy in, in general across the board. But like when it comes to energy security, you, listen, you have to define, even if you're like very laissez faire, you have to define some like market rules that speak to like the long term um, incentives uh, of your society. OK. And so if you design those markets correctly, if you design the rules correctly and you can um, and you can um, you know, incentivize you know, thinking about stability of production, you know, long-term thinking when it comes to prices. Uh, um, yeah, we make way different choices. We value nuclear you know, way more highly, like economic, like the short-term economics would reflect its long-term value. Uh, the, our rules are just a little out of whack with respect to like what's good for us. But like, I can't claim nuclear is unique to that. We've got a lot of you know, sure. silly market structures that don't think you know long term necessarily. Well, let me follow up on that because I think that's a key point that that, and we see it here in Texas, right, with this energy only market where you have the baseload plants that are absolutely critical for grid security, grid stability. They don't get any more love in the market than do the intermittent uh, resources, the solar and the wind, et cetera. So, but, yeah. uh, but you're, you're saying- that's, bad, you, that's a bad market design. That's just a bad market design. Absolutely. And I've been arguing that for a long time, right? This is a government failure to understand this, right? But, but what I'm hearing you say, or I'm paraphrasing back to what you said, you have to have a, and I think this is the other part that I want to get into now is that in my view, you've got to have a more ro robust government backing for nuclear if it's going to win, if it were going to d deploy it at scale. So I heard what you said about more tending to be more laissez faire, but you've got to have for fuel, for, for, for the security of the fuel supply chain, for, for waste disposal, for licensing, you've got to have a robust government uh, backing don't I mean, is that am yeah, i wrong I, i'd be careful with the word backing because backing sometimes often implies subsidy i'm actually not for subsidy i don't like the idea of government picking a winner and i don't like the idea really even of government like investing in technology i would much rather them just design the market rules um appropriately and then you know let the market um bring forth new technologies and bring winners. I really don't like when the government money gets involved because oftentimes I think it's like very well intentioned. And historically, sometimes it has worked out like like the French nuclear bailout that has worked out. But like we are in a different time. We are in different. We have different like countervailing private incentives that have matured over the years. So like one is like um, the graft that I see in the EPC industry 
that didn't exist back in like the US in the 1960s. But and, now and, like- I'm sorry, EPC, forgive me. Oh, sorry, what? I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. That's so stupid. I should have, I'm, I'm the guy, the acronym guy, and I, here and I am. No, 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 that's fine. I'm, 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 yeah, I yeah. interrupt a lot. Go ahead. No, please. Engineering, procurement, and construction. So these are like the giant companies, like the Bechtels, Jacobs, Kiewitz, Floors. These are ones that build big projects, everything right. from like bridges to tunnels to nuclear sure. plants. The problem is their business model has evolved or matured to the point where they don't think about like long term lots of production of infrastructure. What they think about is how do I milk as much out of any given project as I possibly can? Um, and so even if you were to set up like a government incentive program that poured money into nuclear, there's nothing saying that that would be successful. That might just all be stolen by the engineering procurement and construction companies, not like illegally stolen, but just stolen by their business model as it exists today, where that might not have been the case in 1970s France, 1960s US, um, so on and so forth. Well, so yeah, stolen is a, stolen is a strong word, but we'll, we'll let that go. But the, the so if I'm gonna read back to you or reflect back, what I think you're saying is then that we needed this model for production of reactors has to change that i mean this is what we've heard over and over again about smrs is we want a more construct a more manufacturing based idea around stamping these out and stamping isn't the right exact exact right word but you think that we need a different model not just on the regulatory side but on how the plants are actually put together is that is that is that how you, what you're saying i happen to agree with that but that wasn't what i was saying so okay. i will <laughs> okay draw the, sure. I'll, I'll, Go let me draw the distinction sure i i actually think that it is perfectly fine to do your typical stick built construction for you know gigawatt scale or maybe ideally like half gigawatt scale plants like the way that it was done in the 60s very successfully here in the us or in the 70s in france um or 80s in sweden and south korea so i actually think that's i actually think that that's fine um what i don't think is fine is when uh, the government creates a, a certain economic model to support these projects that leads to the project failure, even though it looks like the government is subsidizing or helping, such as like guarantees of money. Like, cause if you don't have like that private market, like pushback where there are a lot of bankers and insurance companies and lawyers and like, engineering managers, like all properly incentivized to keep costs down, I promise you costs will increase. And that has nothing to do with the construction methodology. Now, I also happen to think that having this idea of more ma smaller sized, more manufacturing based um, construction, uh, uh, like prefab holds great promise for the nuclear industry as it has been demonstrated in the oil and gas and chemical and now even data center industries, this idea of modular construction. Well, so then, well, let's follow on that. So what, what's the sweet spot then? And, and I want to come, I want to come back to last energy in just a minute, but what's the sweet spot now? Um, you know, we've seen the Akaludo uh, plant come online, but that's a, what, uh, that's a gigawatt scale reactor, right? And Oklo, and I want to talk about Oklo because I know you had Jake DeWitt on your, on the Titans of Nuclear that's podcast great, just yeah. recently. Um, you know, that's one and a half megawatts. I mean, <laughs> one, 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 one thousandth almost of the size of the gigawatt scale reactor. So w w you've spent a lot of time looking at the market and you're in now in a, with a company that's looking to deploy reactors. What's what size are you trying? Are you, you where do you think is the one that offers the most promise? Hundred megawatts, two hundred. What's what's your what's your theory on that? Yeah, I mean, I think eventually when the industry gets its rhythm back, I think like probably yeah, like two to five hundred is probably the sweet spot in terms of size. Um, above five hundred, and I actually don't think it really has much to do with the power output, but rather the total capital cost of the project itself. Right. Yeah, I tend to find that when a project exceeds a billion dollars that that number can very quickly climb to two billion and very quickly climb to five billion that has nothing to do with the technology itself like that could happen on bridges or tunnels not just nuclear projects and so i think you and so i think that 500 megawatt size is very easy to keep underneath the billion dollar threshold and has historically been demonstrated to do so you just can't have all of the like other like regulatory craziness that layers on cost after cost in a nuclear system. Well, so if you're saying 500 megawatts at a billion, my quick math, that's $2,000 a, a, a kilowatt, right? I mean, that's that's yeah. a pretty low number from what we're seeing. Oh, yeah. But well, then, let yeah, me... well, that's easily demonstrated in other comparable power facilities and even in the nuclear sector historically. So yes, that would that is, 
ambitious according to the last few nuclear plants that were built standards, but that is like a totally reasonable number if you just took out the word nuclear and said thermal power plant. Right. Because you can build gas for about a thousand dollars. A thousand less. Yeah. yeah like 900, right. something crazy. Right. Crazy. Well, so then why, let me, let me ask a quick, cause I really don't, you know, I have some theories. So why is plant Vogel? Why, why has it been so insanely expensive? It's what two X, the, the original estimated cost is way over time, way over budget. Why the cost overruns for, for these plants that are going to be owned by Southern company or Georgia power. Um, they're way over budget. AP 1000s, this is the cutting edge. Why, why has it been so crazy expensive and why is it taking so long? Yeah, once again, I'm not, not an expert on this particular topic. Other people are a little bit better versed than I am, but I'll, I'll give you a couple, I'll, I'll give you my opinion and a couple sure. of insights that I've seen through talking to people over the years. I think it was a real confluence of errors. Um, I mean, we're only even talking about it right now because it actually has survived these errors. You know, the Sumner plant, didn't survive them. And so, right. Um, yeah, these errors are pretty bad, but, uh, I think there is a bit of, um, you know, uh, a bit of Westinghouse at fault, you know, and they went bankrupt because of it, like how they structured like their model and their guarantees. Um, so I'm not like criticizing Westinghouse as a company, you know, now or the people there, I'm just saying like, it's pretty clear that there was a business model problem. Right. Uh, and so there, so there's like some real structural structural problems there. There were some really crazy things that happened that made absolutely no sense when it comes to like you know regulatory scrutiny. Such a, you know one story I heard is like the rebar spacing, you know, was only precise to within you know uh, half an inch when they promised a quarter of an inch or something like that. I don't know the exact numbers, and it actually didn't have any material impact on the structural integrity. But because that's what they put in their ap application. They had to tear it all up and redo it. And uh, that cost them a billion dollars. Wow. So like there's stuff like that. There's stuff like, yeah, hey, it's a giant construction project. It's just so big. It's over that billion dollar threshold that I talked about. So the costs are just going to pile on and pile on. Um, I do think that there's a lot of bad behavior amongst the engineering procurement construction firms, the general contractors. They like the change orders. They like when the regulator comes in and say, take out all that concrete. That's another billion dollars for them of work. They love that. And they don't see this as like a long term viable business model them produce, you know, them building a lot of nuclear power plants. So they don't do the other things that companies would normally do to push back and keep costs under control. And then I also think that. Um, this whole thing, which, you know, you know, sometimes people call it like regulated asset base across the world. But, you know, in this case, the Georgia taxpayers were forced to put up money for the project before it was delivered. Some people herald that as like a, like a good thing. Ah, it shows the value of nuclear. But I, I think just from like a pure like market based incentive um, point of view, it, it really screws things up. Like if you tell people, if you start paying people before they like deliver a good job and you keep paying them when they keep doing a bad job, what do you think they're going to do? Um, so like I am personally very against this idea of the government's prepaying for nuclear uh, plants or the utilities, you know, charging the, the rate payer ahead of the delivery of the project. Like if it's a good project, investors will pay for it up front because they're going to reap a lot of long term benefit. And if no investors are willing to put up for it, it's probably a bad project. So like you shouldn't force that on the public um, from an economics perspective. I think sure. there are certain things like, yeah, yes, that investors wouldn't value that the public does value in terms of like, you know, long-term value, clean air, all these kind of things. And yes, we should consider those. Bridge, bridges or hospitals or libraries or things yeah, that you, yeah, if you're going to build yeah. it and the, the public can build, pay for it ahead of time or because they're yeah. going to get the benefit. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not against it overall, this idea, but I just think we should like, if we have something that we want to incentivize, let's design a market that incentivizes that and not, and not, you know, put a lot of money up front that might just get sunk down the drain. Sure. Well, so then, you know, so we've talked now for a good bit about what you're seeing that isn't working or, you know, the things that you think are, are, are wrong, the structures are incorrect or, or, or the, the incentives are in the wrong place. Like what Charlie Munger said famously, show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. So, well, walk me through what's the better model here and then and, and introduce Last Energy. What is this company? Because I was just looking at a headline about, uh, oh, that, that, uh, yeah, in fact, it was a, a story was just published a couple of days ago. Uh, the UK government say it could build hundreds of, of SMRs. It mentions Last Energy, uh, supposedly backed by um, by Elon Musk. Um, I mean, what is what's the way forward, and what is Last Energy? 
Yeah, well, first I'll just issue a quick correction. We're not backed by Elon Musk. We're backed by Gigafund, which also in their very select portfolio includes three of Elon Musk's companies. Okay. So I'll just make that you know pretty clear up front. So yes. And, and, and who is Gigafund? I've not heard of that. Gigafund, um, uh, Luke and Steve are the partners over there. It's a venture capital fund, really ambitious, you know, um, couple guys. Uh, they used to be part of Founders Fund, a really well-known um, investment company. Okay. Uh, Luke was one of the founders, early founders of PayPal. Um, you know, Steve is also an incredible entrepreneur in his own right. So, yeah, they just have a very select investment portfolio. We're part of that. So is SpaceX and the Boring Company and a few other of Elon's endeavors. Um, sure. Okay. I think that's how that power level was drawn. Um, so, uh, where was I? Um, well, well so then tell, so follow on that then we'll come back to so what tell me about last energy what is it what's the what's the chemistry of the technology yeah so basically um you know we spent a long time you know through the titans of nuclear podcast getting to know the nuclear industry meeting all the stakeholders both in the u.s and abroad and you know really trying to figure out how can nuclear be used to solve our climate and energy challenges um one of the things that we heard over and over again from the uh from the state from key stakeholders governments and utilities like the same thing over and over again everywhere we went they're like we don't want a new technology um we do want it to be privately funded and we do want it to be smaller more manageable projects in size and then you know we met with all of the startups trying to convince them to do that like hey like cut it with the new technology that the customer doesn't want this um and make your project smaller and privately fund them stop asking the government for money um and nobody would do it, <laughs> despite us meeting with like 50 different startups. Um, and so eventually we spun out a development company that is not a nuclear reactor designer. It is a development company that just integrates standard PWR components um, and privately funds these efforts and deploys fleets of yeah, 20 megawatt sized P standard PWRs, no integral physics, no new technology, nothing crazy. PWR pressurized water reactors. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Once again, yes. Oh God, you're good. So, so this PWR is the reactor. this is the new scale model, right? New scale has a. No, they're, they're... no this is not the new scale model. Oh, okay. That, yes, and I just want to be super clear. Okay. We spoke to new scale about this too. Like they have this like, they've got it's an integral reactor. They've got new convection physics they're touting. Um, it's it's a new model for how PWRs are operated. Um, new configuration of the core, different fuel height, even though it is standard fuel pellets, different fuel height, different vessel configurations, different types of steam generators that have never been used before. That is a fundamentally new reactor. Um, now, uh, granted, I'm a big supporter of New Scale. I hope they do well. I hope they sell a million of their units all over the, the country. But that's not what customers were telling us they wanted. And we do what customers want, period, end of story. No new technology. Well, so then walk me through then, because there you're saying 20 megawatt reactor with a pressurized water reactor design using yep. components that are are familiar in the industry, steam generators, the the turbines, the other you know a balance of system stuff. But where is that? I mean, who's making those reactors? What because that's the other thing you need, right? You need that reactor vessel. You need that system in place. Sure. Where, yeah, there are hundreds. From, from where will that come? There are hundreds of hundreds of suppliers for this. Let's let's look back to the old nuclear industry. Okay. Um, in the 1960s, because we just in many ways we just adopted that model. Um, the utilities designed their own nuclear power plants back then. Westinghouse, GE, they'd come in with the fuel, but the utilities did the design work, as is common across the world today, where every power plant is in some sense like a boutique one off. Yeah, sometimes a few of them are clustered together. But essentially what you do is either a utility or back to this EPC word, engineering procurement construction firm, you give them design requirements. They design it for you. You pay them money. It is right. literally as simple as that. Now, what we do last energy as an organization is a bit more complicated that hiring the EPC portion is just one small part of what we do. We also line up the financing. We do the permits. We do the licensing. We manage all of these subcontractors. We manage um, teams of EPCs, engineering and procurement construction firms. We manage general contractors. So we are like a almost like a real estate development company. We're like, yes, you know, we don't necessarily like need to have a structural engineer staff, though we do. Um, 
what we do is we organize the project and we deliver it just like is done very commonly today throughout the entire power industry, both for thermal power and renewables. There's this role of a developer. That's what we saw missing. That's the role that we stepped in to fill. Gotcha. Okay, so I'm with you so far, but but I'm coming back to the hardware because that seems to me to be the continuing sticking point. I want to come back to the NRC as well and the regulatory part of this. But you're saying that as a project manager, developer, that Last Energy will be able to then go to a potential customer in Britain or somewhere around the world and say, well, we'll, de we'll develop it and we'll give you a 20 megawatt or 50 megawatt reactor. But where does the, from where does the reactor come? Who makes that part of it? Because that chemistry, that, that, that vessel, that thing is the, is the hardest part of the, thi the, the you are, thing. You're mistaken. Thing. You're mistaken. Oh. That's, not, that's not the hardest part. That might even be the easiest part. Oh, really? Okay. Well, then correct me. I, 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 I thought that the NRC regulatory thicket was the one that's the most difficult part of this. Ah, okay. Now you're saying something different. Okay. Well, I'm, jumping, I'm, jumping all, I'm jumping all no, around no, that's, here. That's then. Fine. The technical <laughs> design of a core is extremely straightforward if you stick to the conventional technologies that have been in the like public arena for the last 70 years since the, um, since the okay. U.S. government essentially release those and once again back in the 60s there were like 18 different like reactor vendors oh reactor oems you know in addition to westinghouse and ge the reactor part is the easiest part the technical design of it if if, if you stick i'm interrupting here if you stick with the the what we exact, know what has yeah, been what is the exact pwr configuration the, the, the light water, not mess around with any chemistry or materials or anything exactly so as yeah. long as you stay with the light water reactor and the, that design that is virtually all of the reactors that have been deployed in the u.s as long as you stay in that narrow lane you're saying that the regulatory hurdles are fairly straightforward what well no in the u.s <laughs> I'm saying the technical hurdles are extremely straightforward. Uh, the regulatory okay. hurdles are still uh, a nightmare. Uh, okay. uh, but that is something <laughs> okay. that we specialize in. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. So I'm with you so far. Well, so then let's jump to the NRC then, because this is the part where, and I've talked with a bunch of people. In fact, I've done, did an interview this, you know, last night and another one this morning on talking to people about this, that after the cancellation of Okla, which came just to, or the, the rejection of their application by the NRC, which happened just a few weeks after the Chinese announced the, 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 the uh, production of commercial power from a helium cooled gas reactor in Shandong province. Then a few weeks after the Okla thing, the NRC, re, you know, rescinds the license extensions for two nuclear reactors in the U.S., there are two plants, Peach Bottom and Turkey, uh, Turkey Thicket. I'm just thinking, or Turkey, or Peach Bottom and Turkey Point. I'm thinking, well, what is going on here? I mean, it, it makes yeah. me think that the NRC is, and I'm going to say it, hopeless when it comes to the deployment of new nuclear in America. And uh, am I am I too negative on this? First off, let me start by saying that I think the people that work at the NRC, like I've met a lot of them, great people, smart, nice, well intentioned. Like, okay, so the people there, like this, I'm not, I'm not going to cast any aspersions. There you them. go. Okay. Um, I think the institution itself has a challenge. Uh, yeah, I also like, I mean, uh, when the Oklos application was rejected and the Turkey Point thing, I think those were like two of the times I was like most like frustrated or like actually visibly upset like in my adult life. Um, you took it personally. Yeah, well, it's just, no, it's just, I, I was sad. I was just sad um, because here are some opportunities like for some like nuclear successes that are you know well-deserved and it just didn't happen. Um, so uh, here's the problem. I, like I've been playing this idea around and I would like someone to correct me if I'm wrong, but I am pretty sure that the NRC in its entire existence since it was formed in 1973 has never licensed a new design and seen it through operation. Not once, not for a research reactor, not for a power reactor, ever. Yes, there have been some ones that were started prior to 1973 that got their operating license after. Yes, there have been four or five that have gotten a license from the NRC, but have never actually operated. Vogel might be the first, but in its entire history, it has never licensed a new design, not a research reactor, not a power reactor, not ever. Right, and a, new, that, a new design that's actually been built. 
new design that's been built, right? Yeah, and I think I think that's from everything that I've heard. That's exactly that's that's correct. And, and yeah. the, we've they've they've approved the light water design, and that's it. And there's nothing new. And that this idea of a new chemistry is just simply an. Well, if I'm going to bounce ahead, is saying that's a non-starter because that's not what the you know they haven't done it in 50 years. Why well, I think it's, it's, it's going to change that, now. Even light water reactor designs, all of the ones that have received their operating license from them were started based on a design that was already approved by the Atomic Energy Commission, the predecessor to the NRC. So those were grandfathered in. There have been like four or five new light water designs, you know, including you know, two from GE so far, the ABWR and the ESBWR, that they've spent a billion dollars getting their license, got their license, but then they couldn't build it. Like they couldn't operate the other because like the licensing itself adds so much cost, um, uh, both to both to like now the fixed upfront cost that you have to pay off or amortize over different units that might make it uh, unaffordable or to the actual things that you, systems that you need to add to the power plants. I, when I see a $10 billion nuclear power plant, I can tell you right now, there are $9 billion worth of uh, unnecessary, in my opinion, regulatory imposed additions. Every $10 billion new nuclear plant could be $1 billion because you know what, that's how we did it in the 60s and those are still the opera that are safe enough to operate today like they're not safe enough shut them down but you can't like have a double standard um those yeah a lot of our operating reactors were re today like point p1 and two super cheap in today's dollars 730 million dollars for 1100 megawatts that's real cheap and that's in today's dollars right um, and those are operating today point p22 well so then but but Okay, well, I, I'm a little flummoxed here because I'm, I'm I'm hearing you say that it's possible to get the 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 approval for the reactors that, but only if you keep in that narrow lane of what's already been approved. It's, right? No, or it's the, possible the, to get it's possible to get approval for a new reactor, but in doing so, it makes the actual implementation of that reactor cost prohibitive, um, and maybe even impossible to actually get your operating license. Vogel will be the first to disprove that. Okay, so then, so then, walk me through then. What I mean, what's the way forward then, given what we've just discussed with the NRC as a kind of an it's this intractable kind of uh, regulatory body? What, how do we get reactors built at scale? Because I was looking at the Energy Impact Center and your uh, and your description of what you're doing. You're aiming for nothing short of bringing nuclear energy to never before realized heights to enable rapid decarbonization and energy access for all. I love this idea. I love <laughs> the idea. I'm adamantly pro nuclear, but I just keep, you know, the more I see and you know, the more I'm, I'm skeptical that we will be able to break this regulatory log jam. So tell me how it happens, please. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I say that and I say that, you know, all due respect, but I'm just like I'm 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 just, you know, looking at this landscape and thinking, especially now with Rosatom effectively out of the game, right? With the the Russians they so the biggest commercial supplier in the world for for reactors to other, you know, foreign countries outside of Russia, it seems like a great commercial opportunity if, if we had a reactor design that we could deploy. But I've interrupted myself here. So what's the way forward? How does this work? Yeah. Okay. Let me start high level. So on sure. a global scale, in order to address our, our carbon and energy problems, we actually don't need nuclear evenly distributed around the globe. You could even have just maybe a few points where you put tens of thousands of gigawatts of nuclear energy and then use that to both draw down CO2 from the air and either sequester it or turn it into carbon neutral fuels where you ship it around the planet, like a synthetic Saudi Arabia, one might say. So you actually don't need nuclear everywhere. You just need to find a few jurisdictions that are that are open, friendly, and interested in, I don't know, capturing the entire world's energy uh, production value chain. Um, so, so, you're, that, you're, so you're saying air capture then, doing air capture, using I nuclear that, to run air capture. I think that is, the, or, or, or CO2 capture from the water, I think that is the right model to achieve our global decarbonization goals. Okay. Um, in the interim, you can still build, you know, thousands of nuclear plants um, across the world in jurisdictions where the where the regul where the regulator doesn't impose a one billion dollar licensing fee and a nine billion dollar capex to your project. Okay. Um, and there are many places around the world that do that. I mean, we've got you know operating reactors in like thirty plus countries. They've got they've got very competent regulators. Some of those regulators are more interested and able to evaluate new types of technology and design, but certainly you know, almost all of them are capable of, um, of licensing a, uh, a light water reactor. Okay. 
So now bring me back to the U.S. then. So this is your vision. You, you gave me your global. I'm not global sure the U.S. can have nuclear. I'm not sure the U.S. can have any more nuclear unless we like fundamentally change our licensing paradigm. Okay, well, there. So now there, we're back to something that again rhymes with what I'm thinking. That there's, you know, as several people have told me, we need to burn down the NRC, form a new agency, oh, yeah. and start with and start with a new a clean sheet of paper that would allow that regulatory uh, break the regulatory logjam. Is that too harsh? What? How do you? I don't do you think we it? can use the words burn down the NRC because, like, once again, I think yeah. people yeah. that are well intentioned is an institutional problem. Okay, and I don't think making enemies out of the NRC is going to serve your goals of more nuclear because then you're going to have like 3000 like really angry nuclear experts with like sure. government credential titles like working against you in the press Fair oh, and by the way that's on top of the entire renewable industry and the and the rest of the energy industry all working against nuclear now you're going to have the nuclear regulators also working against nuclear publicly <laughs> okay. that's okay. a disaster okay yeah. okay fair enough so brett I, I take back and by the way just as quick station break i'm talking to brett kugelmas he's the host of the titans of nuclear podcast you can find him at energyimpactcenter.org okay so <laughs> reform the NRC, create an, a parallel agency to the NRC, create some, do some regulatory reform, some, what's the way to break the regulatory logjam? Well, I think you have to first see nuclear success elsewhere in order to garner the political support domestically to take any like serious action. So, so it I has think to work it, in Canada. So it would be like terrestrial energy has to get licensed in Canada to light I'm a not fire. Sure, I'm not sure Canada is much better. Um, okay. I, you know, I met with the regulators there. Once again, I, I think they're great people, you know, um, and very intelligent and well-intentioned. But I actually think the Canadian regulator has the exact same institutional challenges that the NRC does. So I don't think Canada is the right way to go. Um, there are other places around the world, though. So, okay, then where? Well, I think there's some, like, very independent nuclear cultures. Um you know, such as Brazil, that, you know, their nuclear regulator essentially is a function of their Navy. Um, and so they just, you know, they're not kind of beholden to the same like institutional hangups that other nuclear regulators might be. So I think that can be a real, um, you know, uh, that can that can be an area that's really poised for leadership um, in nuclear regulations. But there are many others around the world. There's there's a ton of like really esteemed esteemed regulators, you know, throughout Eastern Europe, you know, Europe as a whole. Uh, the UK is one that we're spending a lot of time and attention into. Um, I have, you know, nothing but great things to say about the UK regulator so far through some of our experiences with them. Well, let me follow up on that because Rolls Royce has announced that they're going to be building SMRs, right? And that they right. want to deploy them. And the, one of the other headlines that's been in the well, paper. What's SMR? You, you made you made me break out our acronym. What does SMR stand for? Small modular reactor. Yeah, I would, and I'd be a little careful calling Rolls Royce small okay, <laughs> or okay, even modular. Enough. But okay. yeah, but if you call it like small, medium, sometimes people call them small, medium reactors. And okay. I'd say, yeah, they're a medium reactor. Okay, so tell me about Rolls Royce and what their path to licensing or regula regulatory approval would be. What's the what's the size of their reactor? What's the chemistry and what's their what's their potential for? Because I, I, it's interesting you say this because I think maybe that's an end run around the regulatory logjam, and I kind of, I, I, as I'm thinking about it, I really start to like this idea that you think it can't work in Canada, it can't work in the U.S., but maybe in the U.K. that they have the uh, well-established regulatory framework, and that some other vendor, you know, some other country, and well, you know, I don't know, a sm some, somewhere in Africa, those well, if the Brits approve it, well, then that it's we can, you know, then it must be good, but uh, because it's going to need some kind of imprimatur of some kind of a, of an a, of an authority, right, before it's yeah. going to be accepted. So I, I think that's what you're going to see happen. Yeah, someone like the UK, but there, pl trust me, there are plenty of other regulators that are like very competent. Too. I mean, even South Africa's regulators competent. They've got a PWR down there. They were some of the leaders in looking at pebble bed technology. Right. So it could be South Africa does it and then, you know, other countries follow. UK does it, other countries follow. And I think, yeah, you're going to see like a very confident, interested, um, you know, uh, like risk informed regulator, um, risk rated regulator, I should say, maybe that uses PRA, probabilistic risk analysis or something, you know, something like some, some like framework that's a little bit more pliable. Um, or a little bit more reasonable, let's say, to the smaller type reactors, especially. Right. I think you're going to see them pioneer it, then you're going to see another set of regulators follow. You're going to see this, you know, nuclear plants going up all around the world, probably not in the U.S. The U.S. is just going to be a laggard. And then eventually enough people in Congress are going to be upset that they say, how is it possible that, you know, Bulgaria is able to, like, you know, build 
you know, four new power, pa nuclear power plants in two years. But like, you know, here in the US, the greatest country on planet Earth, like we can't do this, like what's wrong with us? And I think then there's going to be some accountability and some like institutional reform at that point. But that could be 10 years from now. That could be 15. That could be never. Right. So if the, the political strategy, the regulatory strategy is to embarrass the guilty. <laughs> I'm, I say yeah, that as a, I say that I say that in a, in a, in a but yeah. you know Jennifer uh, no Jessica Mitford was a famous muckraking journalist. She wrote the American Way of Death, and I interviewed her a long, long time ago about the funeral industry. But she said you may not be able to change the world, but at least you can embarrass the guilty. <laughs> so, so you're saying, but this is a strategy, a regulatory strategy around that if, if the if the Brits come up with a regulatory framework and they 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 deploy new reactors at scale that that would light a fire under policymakers in the u.s to to get their act together i don't think if the brits do it it'll light a fire under the u.s i think that if like 10 or 20 like mid-tier countries do it then it'll then it'll be forced to light a fire under the u.s yeah but you're as pessimistic if I'm hearing what you say that U.S. is going it, it will be a laggard. I mean, you're not optimistic about the regulatory framework here. I mean, I also see a scenario where if enough money just gets like you know set on fire, that like yeah, the AP one thousand will get finished in Vogel. They'll have like, and then you'll pay a billion dollar fee for each new place you want to put it, and you'll be able to pay it back because these are you know ten billion dollar projects. Um, I, yeah, maybe there's a scenario in which 20 AP1000s or EPRs or something gets built, but it's those aren't great businesses for like rapid global expansion. They they can do something. Uh, I'm never going to say no to a gigawatt of new nuclear power, right. but I, I don't see that as like, you know, revolutionizing the system in a way that we can actually meet our clean energy goals in a timely manner. Well, I, I agree. I mean, I think... You know, I've said if, if you're anti-nuclear and anti-carbon dioxide, you're pro-blackout, and I'm anti-blackout. I'm very seriously anti-blackout. Black long and all sorts of other issues. Yeah. Well, right, of course, but but the, but but let's go back to Rolls Royce. What is the promise there? What is their what's their technology and what's their hope for getting regulatory approval and then and then deployment at at commercial scale? Yeah, listen, I like Rolls Royce. I think their idea is like pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Hey, let's build a medium scale uh, PWR, and Rolls Royce has some. Um, you know, credentials coming from you know, deploying nuclear subs for the British Navy. Uh, I, I don't know how much, you know, mixing and matching there are between those two divisions of the company, but certainly like, you know, Rolls-Royce is a defense contractor. You know, they can engage, they know how to engage the UK government. Their, their design and approach seems like simple enough. It's like, yeah, let's build a bunch of medium, bunch of medium PWRs. And I think that's a good idea. Um, I don't know how quick or how fast, or if they've got the entrepreneurial spirit to really revitalize the industry. Um, but like, yeah, I'm pretty pro what they're doing overall. Well, it's interesting. So good. Well, I'm glad because I, uh, you know, I think that there's, there has to be some progress in the French. Now Macron has said that they're going to, you know, push forward in SMRs, but so uh, we talked around this is the, is Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Is this an inflection point for the nuclear sector? I think it was already happening. I think even before the invasion, like there was definitely enough concern about energy security. The UK was already kind of pumping money into um, Rolls-Royce's program. I think before the Ukraine invasion, they'd already allocated another couple hundred million dollars to them. Um, people know energy security is an issue. I just think it's like the public now is caught up and that actually gives politicians more air cover to do things they already wanted to do. So yeah, so maybe it is an inflection point um, from that perspective. So then you're, you're an entrepreneur, you've been in this, you know, in this sector for a while. So handicap it, handicap the, you're you're clearly I, I'm I'm not using this word in a pejorative way biased toward the pressurized water reactor the PWR that you think that that's the technology or the chemistry that can scale because it's well known the 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 there aren't many variables it's not a new chemistry it's familiar to regulators so which countries are going to be the ones that lead the lead the charge and 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 start deploying nuclear at scale where do you see the most uh, uh, the most headway the most uh, most traction. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not biased towards a particular technology. Um, I am biased towards giving customers what they want. And okay. this is what All right. fair, is fair, fair, fair enough. Okay, they want. sure. Like the people who actually operate power plants say that they are unwilling to take the risk of downtime that is inherent to messing around with new materials, supply chain, you know, chemistries, that kind of stuff. And so I just 
follow what the customer says. There's other ways to do it. Yes, you can come up with a breakthrough technology and maybe it changes everything and you get customers then to come on board. I, that's not my approach. My approach is do what the customers ask for. So, um, so you think the, the molten salt path then, you just don't, you don't believe that, that that's a viable pathway to commercial success? I, you know, I, I, any of these technologies, I'm sure the reactor is going to work. <laughs> I'm sure of it. Like, like these are really smart people designing these reactors and like nuclear physics has been tried out in a whole like 50 different types of configurations and they all kind of work. Like it's just not that crazy, the reactor part. Um, I, I think what, where these other technologies are going to struggle is with power plant operations issues and downtime of their facility over the first you know, 10 to 20 years of them like working out a lot of those operational kinks. And then, you know, you tell me if you, there's going to be investors and customers that are willing to, you know, ride that through when we have a, like a, a perfectly good enough technology mm. um, that can be deployed really cost effectively and really quickly as demonstrated by history embodied in the light water reactor, specifically the pressurized water reactor, seems to be the one with the least operational issues over its lifetime. And that's why the industry the utilities have gravitated there over time, even when they've had a lot of experience, like the UK industry with like gas cooled reactors or graphite, you know, in the core and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so that's, you know, that's what I think. Though I do think like, listen, I think like, you know, let's say that we get the next, you know, Google out of the nuclear industry and they've got a Google X and they want to put like a billion dollars worth of R&D into new reactor cores um, year over year and work out those operational issues. I'm all for it. Like, I actually think that that's an awesome thing to do and they should do that. I just think that the faster path to deployment, um, both from a business model perspective and also a technology risk perspective is, you know, build stick, what the customers are telling you to build. And that's a PWR. Stick with the tried and true. Yeah. Well, so then let me jump back because I mentioned Jake DeWitt earlier in Oklahoma. How... Uh, and we talked about this and I don't want to spend much time on it, but just a quick reaction on how important was it to you when you, you mentioned the, the license, the, 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 the NRC's pulling back the, the license extensions for the two nuclear plants and one in Pennsylvania, one in Florida, how important or how significant was the Oklo rejection? Emotional impact to me. I was rooting for Jake. I've known Jake for a while. I think he's awesome. I love what he's doing with his company. And so I was really sad when that application got rejected. Um, and so, you know, but they're, they're, he's a smart guy. They're a savvy team. I'm sure they'll figure it out one way or another. But how important is that design technology? I mean, it's just a one and a half megawatt reactor. I mean, you can go to Caterpillar or Cummins anywhere in the world and, you know, get a one and a half megawatt recip engine that will do, will provide electricity, right? It's, you know, you got to use hydrocarbons to make it to fuel it. But were they, was that the right size? I mean, I'm not asking you to critique them necessarily, but is that, is, is this just another example of this intransigence of the NRC or there, is it the, that they're trying this chemistry that is not, they're not familiar with? I don't know. Uh, like, I, I just don't know. I mean, I think what they were trying to do, uh, and once again, I, this is not from them telling me, this is just from me like surmising, but I think sure. what, what, they were what they were trying to do is probably build something really small, show you could get it through the licensing body and then build a bigger version once you kind of like got something up and running. Right. Um, and I thought that was a very reasonable strategy and it just didn't work. And so now it's back to the drawing board and maybe two or three years before they be, before they can can get back into the game. I don't know. I don't know. So how do you you, you founded Energy Impact Center um, and it's at Energy Impact Center dot org. How many how many people are, are working there now? Yeah, 30 and growing. And you know, we employ a lot of subcontractors, big engineering firms, you know, to the tunes of many, many millions of dollars and all you know, to kind of leverage their staff as well. And then also, you know, all, all sorts of subcontracted support, like even for like licensing applications, you know, we work with like giant firms that know nuclear licensing, we subcontract a lot of work to them. Um, so we leverage, you know, our team mostly here, once again, it's like a development company, it's like the management, the hub and spoke model, um, and then leverage, you know, experts around the world and other organizations for more fine tuned expertise. Um, so yeah. So last, ener so last energy and energy impact center are working. Like, ah, together. sorry. Yeah. They're well, yes. Well, energy impact center was the origin story and we have, 
you know, transitioned our work mostly to last energy at this point. And we spun out last energy as a, as a, uh, you know, the development company arm of what we're doing. Um, we don't do too much like raw research anymore, which was like the origin story right. of energy impacts. Right. Well, so, and then how do you, how do you define success then in that, in that field? What are, what are your milestones where you know you're on the right track for what you're doing? How do you measure that? Well, the ultimate success is going to be total decarbonization of planet Earth and energy access for absolutely everybody and relieving all energy poverty, period, end of story. Like, that's the goal. So we're working towards that. We think we can do it um, in a few decades um, or it's probably never going to happen. But I think it can be done in a few decades. Things tend to shift pretty quickly once you've kind of demonstrated that a new model works. And our model, um, you know, is to start deploying fleets of small PWRs, uh, that are standard technology and that's it and, and build up from there and and build them somewhere besides the united states and correct. canada correct correct and so it, and so there there are a lot of countries that are looking at this and a lot of different companies i've talked to people from thorcon i've, I've had carolyn cochran from on from oklo on the podcast i've i've talked to a lot of them as well so you that that potential would be in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, those countries that need more infrastructure, but can can stand to build can would have the labor force and the capability of deploying multiple reactors and doing so in relatively short have the regulatory framework to be able to support them. Is that is that is that what you're looking at? Um, there are a lot of interesting parts of the world. I mean, the, historically, you know, whether or not even light water reactors were built everywhere, there are certainly a whole host of nuclear regulators um, that have been stood up because the country has shown some interest. I even think like, you know, like the Philippines, something was like kind of built there. And then recently there's some new resurgence in interest. So yeah, all over the world, um, there are opportunities. We don't gravitate toward, you know, the poorest countries first. We tend to spend most of our time in Europe um, just because it's easier to do business there overall. But yes, eventually everywhere that, you know, is open to nuclear energy and everywhere that's not, that's okay. You don't have to have it. You can buy chemical fuels that come from nuclear power plants that are carbon neutral. Just that's cool too. Huh? Well, it's a bold vision and I'm glad to, you know, have you kind of explain how you see it because I, I, I mean, we have a lot of inertia behind the systems that are in place and I want to see nuclear succeed. I've just uh, lately become, uh, you know, fairly discouraged, honestly. And, no, uh, don't be discouraged. Well, be okay, helpful. okay. Well then how do you explain the Germans closing after the invasion, they're going to close their nuclear reactors. How do you explain that? I mean, I just, Germans I just, have a history of really idiotic big moves. <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hang my hat on what the Germans. <laughs> you can, okay. That's fair enough. Um, well, so we've been talking for about an hour, Brett, so I don't want to keep you you're, you all day. I um, uh, want to keep this at about an hour. So what are you reading now? You're a busy guy. Obviously, you're, you're juggling a lot of different different projects. What uh, when you're when you're not working or even when you are working, you're reading certain kind of books. Are you reading what, what's on your list? Yeah, I read a lot of textbooks. I read a lot of white papers. Um, you know, when I want to relax, I'll watch like Netflix or something. But yeah, when I read, it's usually um, energy related or, you know, uh, technology related or business related. Textbook. So what, give me an example on a textbook that you're, you're cracking lately. Um, I mean, there's, I mean, there are textbooks on everything, including construction management. I spend a lot of time thinking about construction management right now. Like how do you, you know, keep, uh, keep things on, under cost and schedule control um, and how do you ensure uh, efficient project delivery. That's obviously a big concern of what we do. And so I spend a lot of time looking into that as well. Yeah. It's one area I have no expertise in at all, but I'm, it is, a, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, yeah, incredibly coordinated effort, right. With all the timing and supply chains and everything else that uh, figures into that. Well, so then, you know, you, we've talked, you've got some bold ideas and, you know, completely decarbonized world. I'm, all about it. Electricity for everyone. That's my, my, my goal, air conditioning and, and cold beer for everyone. That's my, that's my, that's my goal. Um, so what gives you hope? What makes you optimistic? Um, listen, I, I think that, um, sorry, I'm just getting alerted that we're running out of time here, but that's okay. No, no problem. Perfect note, to, perfect note to end on. Um, what gives me hope? What gives me optimistic? Listen, I mean, I think that, um, Overall, you know, technology does move like pretty fast and enables you know, fundamental shifts in society. So even if you know, we're, you know, part of my thesis is actually you don't need to advance nuclear technology that much. 
But that doesn't mean that you know the resurgence of nuclear isn't going to be benefited from advances and cultural and societal shifts in other technologies that are happening too. So I, I just don't think that we think that the, like, the, the world isn't as stable as we, we would like to think it to be. So a lot of these things that seem like, you know, intractable problems might actually get shifted just because like the tides of culture, the tides of issues across our planet shift. Like, you know, I don't know, like looking back, are people going to be able to point to like the Ukraine war and say, oh, there was actually some origin in, in how social media and communication like changed people's perceptions and enabled or or made, you know, uh, you know, Putin think this way, or, or is this a result of its paranoia coming out of COVID, which was really, a, you know, bioengineering in a lab in Wuhan, like that changed every, like, you know, things change, things change across the planet really fast. And I do think that there are a lot of ambitious and well-intentioned entrepreneurial uh, people there, like ready to adapt to those changes and reform the world into a very positive place for all humans to coexist, you know, from now until eternity, hopefully. And so I'm just, I'm on that train. I dig it. I mean, it's a great way, great, great place to stop. Yeah. Uh, thanks to Brett Kugelmas. He's uh, at energyimpactcenter.org. He's the CEO of Last Energy, the host of the uh, Titans of Energy podcast. Brett, thanks a million for being on the Power Hungry podcast. It's been fun. Awesome. Thanks for having me. This was a blast. Yeah. Thanks to all you in podcast land. Give us a good rating on your podcast, whatever platform you're on. And until then, we'll see you at the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. Thanks.